Kia ora Welcome back everyone to this afternoon's session. The focus of this afternoon's session is the economic environment and I'm pleased to announce that I'm just keeping an eye on the numbers. We've now got over 750 uh, attendees at today's session so great to see that level of support. Shortly we will have a ministerial address from the Honourable Stuart Nash, Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Minister of Forestry, Small Businesses, Tourism, and that will be followed by a Q&A session. As we move into the afternoon and focus on the economy, we'll hear from Andrew Weir, author and city economist from the City of Melbourne, followed by the ANZ Chief Economist, Sharon Zollner, ANZ Group Chief Economist, Richard Yetzinger, and ANZ Greater China Chief Economist, Raymond Young on the role of infrastructure in the global economy and the global recovery. Brad Olson will now take a deeper dive in as Principal Economist and Director of Infometrics. We'll talk about the, the economic challenges and in infrastructure, particularly the skills shortage that we've heard so much about this morning and the supply chain issues, again, that we heard so much about this morning. That will be followed by a panel discussion on infrastructure and financing state of play and the way forward and that will be facilitated by Simpson Grayson partner of banking and finance Joyce Cairns. At the same time we'll be running a second panel facilitated by Ian Purdy, head of property and infrastructure investment at ACC and that will examine the COVID-19 economic recovery with a particular focus on regional recovery and where to from here. And IMZ General Manager Claire Edmondson will close this afternoon's session. And on that note, I'd like the opportunity to introduce Claire to our members. Claire, as you know, was appointed General Manager of Infrastructure New Zealand in July. Um, but again, probably useful to share with you part of Claire's very, very impressive CV. She hails from the UK, not from Ireland, but will not mention the rugby and holds a Bachelor of Law with honours. She is currently completing a PhD in Law and Criminology at AUT. As she tells me, being General Manager of Infrastructure New Zealand and that PhD are not necessarily linked. Claire has more than 18 years consulting experience, experience specialising in central and local government public policy, including most recently on the wage subsidy scheme and the resurgence support payment working on several matters of national importance, including large-scale infrastructure projects. Whilst her immediate focus at IMZ has been on delivering building nations, she has already added considerably to IMZ's relationship with government and its ministers. Claire has held several roles in Christchurch following the Canterbury earthquakes, including as Chief Advisor to the Chief Executive of CERA, and later as Acting Chief of Staff to Christchurch Mayor Leanne Delzell, and was Strategic Advisor to the Crown Manager of Christchurch City Council following the City's loss of accreditation to issue building consents. She was the Establishment Lead for Communications and Governance in the uh, company, sorry, the Crown Company Otakaro, responsible for delivery of major infrastructure projects in Central Christchurch. Claire was also a Senior Advisor to the Royal Commission into the Canterbury earthquakes and the senior ministerial advisor to the Minister of Education to the post-quake Christchurch School Renewals Programme and Novapay and has worked as a management consultant with both PwC and Martin Jenkins. So fair to say that Claire has the necessary and probably more than the necessary credentials to lead IMZ in the next stage of our journey. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Claire to introduce Minister Nash. Thank you, Margaret. So this is my first opportunity to address INZ members, and I'd like to thank those that I've already met and that have made me feel so welcome. So someone has to be the first, and I'm pleased to be the first woman to lead the Infrastructure New Zealand team. The first big task we had since I was appointed in July was delivering Building Nations following the board decision to go virt virtual. We are a small team but we put members at the center of all that we've done and got stuck in over the past six weeks or so to get us here today. So my heartfelt thanks to the team for the long hours and diligence they put in behind the, the scenes. 
So as we all know, the infrastructure sector is an exciting one to be part of with a range of complex issues to address. As Margaret alluded to, it's a sector I've been involved with before, working with ministers and at a senior level in government departments on complex, high profile and large scale projects in post quite Christchurch. High level policy and advocacy will be vital as we move forward and will be a key part of the INZ work program next year. What we've heard ahead what we have heard ahead of us will not be easy for all sorts of reasons and will take some navigating, but Infrastructure New Zealand is well placed to continue to champion the cause on the sector's behalf. And I will look forward to meeting those members I haven't met yet as we crack on in 2020, 2022 and beyond. So you'll see, you'll see me again during Building Nations, but for now, it's my pleasure to introduce the Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Minister for Forestry, Minister for Small Business, Minister for Tourism, the Honourable Stuart Nash, for his ministerial address on COVID-19 and economic development, followed by a Q&A. So I just want to give a quick bio of um, Minister Nash. So the Honourable Stuart Nash first entered politics in 2008 as a list MP and was elected Labour MP for Napier in 2014. In his maiden speech, Minister Nash described himself as the first and foremost a public servant employed by the people of New Zealand and as a social democrat committed to sustainable economic development and growth. In 2017, he was sworn in as Minister of Police, Revenue, Fisheries and for Small Business. In, and in the 2020 Labour government, he was given a suite of portfolios focusing on supporting economic activity in our regions. As the Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Tourism Minister, Forestry and the Minister for Small Business, but before entering politics, Minister Nash worked in senior management in small and large organisations in both the public and private sectors. His wide range in career has included roles in IT, sales, marketing, business strategy, resource planning, strategic planning and general management. management. Minister Nash has completed a Bachelor of Arts History at Victoria University before moving to Canterbury University, where he gained a postgraduate diploma in forestry and a master's in, for in forestry science. He also holds a postgraduate diploma and a master's degree in business management and a master's of law. So thank you, Minister Nash, for coming here today. And that thank is a massive you. <laughs> thank you very much, Claire. Much appreciated. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation to address you today. I understand that my colleague and great friend, the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson, um, has addressed you this morning, so I won't go through the stats, read the economy that no doubt you have heard. But I do want to give credit to Grant and the amazing work he has put into ensuring our economy not only survives, but begins the process of transformation in a time of global pandemic. It's been a, a most interesting journey to be part of the economic team over the last four years. You will Look, you'll have heard many politicians say that the best economic response is a strong health response. And I've used this line many times myself over the last uh, few months when I, on my Mike Hosking show, but I believe you can actually flip this on its head and say the best health response is a strong economic response because we got money out the door in terms of the initial lockdown and, and the form of the wage subsidy faster than any country. And that allowed people to remain connected, not only to their places of employment, but also to their communities. And this has allowed us to roll out a vaccine program so successfully because of a very, I believe, a very high level of trust. Ignore the media's current fascination with anti-vaxxers. Over 90% of the population buy into the reasons and rationale behind the vaccination, and I believe will we'll end up being in the top three in terms of uh, vaccinated populations in the OECD. Hey, what I would like to do is take a bit of time to talk about what, I, what I'm seeing globally and then putting this into a current New Zealand context and then briefly weave this into the narrative around the work program that's currently underway. Globally, that's influencing the economic development work program and, and my thinking in this space. And what is driving economic strategy work that is so important to drive sustainable growth in a way that enhances the health and well-being of our economy and communities, drives our global brand, and meets, if not exceeds, both domestic and international markets and consumers of New Zealand products and information. First one, and I think this is pretty important, the end of the market-led Washington consensus where governments get out of the way 
and only interfere when we see market failure. And the beginning of what is, I think, going to be um, labelled the Cornwall Consensus, which is about governments and markets working together to drive change and sustainability in a way, in a way, prepare the economy as opposed to repair the economy. This is a pivotal change in, uh, in the way that governments um, operate with the market. It helps set the agenda and drive economic growth and participation in a particular direction. To sum up, I suppose, it's providing a new answer to the age-old question, what role does the government have in driving economic development and setting market conditions? The second thing is recognition that climate change and the environment are real and the challenges facing our economies will require a different approach, a cultural change almost to 20th century business as usual. It includes accelerating market circularity, funding green technology, re investment strategies while guarding against greenwashing. The government is leading the charge in this. Minister Shaw and myself co-chair a state sector carbon neutral 2025 program because we feel as, you know if we're going out there talking to the market about what needs to be done then we need to be uh, walking the walk. But it's certainly creating a form and this isn't about creating a form of global competitive advantage in any way shape or form it's certainly meeting it's, it's simply meeting the expectations of global markets and consumers. The third thing is supply chains and critical market fragilities. This is changing as the just-in-time model. It has done us so well over the past two generations and enriched many a Harvard management professor is no longer fit for purpose. This is being replaced by a building resilience across the supply chain model as importers are now buying early, holding new stock, rethinking and reimagining what supply chains integrity now looks like, which is, of course, driving up costs and therefore fueling inflation. Let me give you just one example. In the States, outside the, uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach, off the, off the ports of LA and Long Beach, there are 80 ships with 500,000 containers waiting to be unloaded. So this is a global problem. We're told that over 68% of global supply chains are disrupted. And as a country at the bottom of the earth that relies on global networks, this is causing us a world of problem that we've got to find solutions to. Number four, the role of governments in driving and leading digital governance and the role of digital technologies in terms of driving sustainable growth. I used to say pre-COVID-19 that this was the last generation of business owner that would survive, let alone thrive, without being digitally enabled. And it is so much more relative uh, or relevant today. Everything we are doing as a government, be that um, uh, paying your tax, uh, being invoiced, digital, uh, sorry, um, procurement, will be based around digital technologies. And if you're not digitally enabled or have some form of digital competency, then I think you will be left behind. One of the privileges I have is I chair the OECD's Digital for Small Business. And uh, looking at what is going on around the world, there are significant innovations across the small business sector. And if our small businesses don't embrace technology in a way that will drive change, then they run the very real risk of being left behind. And I do not think we can underestimate the role that technology will play in terms of driving productivity and global sustainability and competitiveness. The government will need to take action on increasing cyber threats, technical standards and regulations, reforming um, regulatory policy and creating a fair tax regime and creating a common framework for crypto technologies and assets. But digital technologies is here and it is hugely important at the macro and the micro. Five, the increased focus on labor standards and participation, driving up a high wage, High skilled economy and an emphasis on labor and health outcomes as we build forward. In 1999, McKinsey talked about a war for talent. I think we'll probably need to reframe that in terms of a war for labor. And the reason I say that is, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic, we have 3.8% unemployment. Australia has around 350,000 job vacancies. The UK has over a million job vacancies. The United States, so the Economist tells us, has over 9 million job vacancies. So go on to the, and go on to the days when in New Zealand we can say, hey, look, come and work in New Zealand. It's cheaper to live here. We've got a greater standard of living. You know, the, the, the wages mightn't be as good as they are in other countries, but we can provide uh, a quality of life that you can't get 
in other jurisdictions. I think that that narrative has, is fast disappearing. There will be a war for talent and labor will be mobile. There is a, there's an investment um, guru who's been around for a long time. He's an economic historian as well as an investment guy. I don't know, he's worth a couple of billion dollars, so he knows what he's talking about. But he believes that the, the power pendulum will swing very soon from employers to employees and unions as, as populations decline and labor markets are stretched. And again, hence the reason why we need to drive productivity through um, technological change as opposed to just relying on labor. The sixth thing is we need to strengthen the global trading system. This is vital to New Zealand and we play and we need to play a leading role in a rules based system that will help guarantee rather than impede global climate actions, as well as continue to break down barriers to fulfilling our global trade ambitions. And, and Damien O'Connor uh, is traveling the world, spending more time in MIQ than you wish anyone, uh, seeks to, uh, to cement New Zealand's place in this, in this new world. And seven, the last one I'll mention, but, but certainly not the last variable considered, is our growing reliance on China. The quote that I love from my history days is the first thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. And I don't think we're in a, in a place we were when we had a super reliance on Britain before uh, they joined the EEC, but, but we certainly are, have a building reliance on China. And uh, at a point in time when the geopolitical world is uncertain and we need to sure, ensure that we build in a form of economic resilience. Let me talk just very briefly. I think I've got about 10 minutes left of my right there, Claire very briefly about what we're doing in terms of, of um, meeting the ambitions and the challenges that I've talked about. First and foremost, driving productivity. We have something, we have a series of projects, macro projects underway called industry transformation plans. And I have no doubt that some of the people uh, on this conference, virtual conference are part of this. These are areas where we believe we can form some form of global competitive advantage, but absolutely acknowledge where we need to drive productivity. In the past, we've relied too much on labor and not enough on capital. The, the price of labor has been cheap and the price of the cost of capital has been one of the most expensive in the OECD. That has had in the past great labor market outcomes, but very, very poor productivity outcomes. And if you look at all the stats, we have one of the lowest labor market or multi-factor productivity um, uh, figures in the world. So we need to drive productivity. And this is this is looking at innovative strategies and far-reaching um, policies. And when I talk about um, uh, the government working with markets, this epitomizes this in the fact that we are sitting down with key market, key private sector players and saying, what do we need to do? How do we work together to drive productivity? The second thing is digital. McKinsey reckoned that um, in the States um, about, uh, five years worth of digital uptake was compressed into eight weeks. And if, if you know that digital uh, innovation uptake curve is your stock standard bell curve, that's been thrown out the window in the COVID environment where people have understood that if you don't have a form of, of digital competency or certainly a digital platform or trading platform, then your ability to gen generate revenue has just all but disappeared. We have put in place something called Digital Boost, uh, a whole series of free videos uh, for, for small to medium businesses, whether they're starting the digital journey or at any point along that, that paradigm. So far, there's about 26,000 companies and about 40,000 people who have accessed this and are a part of it. Another thing we're looking at is access to finance in a world of financial uncertainty, where our banks are pretty much geared up to lending to houses and property, and we, we you know, the stats show that, but struggle to lend to SMEs. So we're looking at um, the Business Growth Fund, and the Minister of Finance and I are at the point of developing this to see if there is a, a very solid business case to put this forward. Let me just talk very briefly about um, regional economic development policies. As everyone will be aware, certainly those who work in the regions, there was a $3 billion region, uh, provincial growth fund uh, that was put out in place. And um, uh, this 100 projects that are under management. So we've completed about 400. So there's still a lot of work being done in the regions uh, under the Provincial Growth Fund banner. But in essence, what the Provincial Growth Fund, so I was out, take a step back, I was our minister, uh, sorry, our um, economic development spokesperson uh, in opposition before 2017. And I had a good look at every single economic development report that came through. And there are a number of very good strategies that have been put in place 
by the regions in consultation with key stakeholders. And what happened when the Provincial Growth Fund came along is a lot of that discipline went out the window as regions said, how the hell do we get our hands on some of this $3 billion? What we're trying to do now, what we will do now, is actually bring a level of that discipline and that um, key stakeholder uh, consultation back. We have something called the Regional Strategic Partnership Fund. It's a $200 million fund, uh, which we will invest in a way that, um, that drives economic productivity. When I talked about our industry transformation plans, it'll sort of be directed towards that. It is for spending in the regions, but it will be a lot more disciplined than the Provincial Growth Fund will be. And what we are asking regions to do is sit down and understand where your regional competitive, advantage are, uh, regional competitive advantages are, where you would like help from the government to overcome barriers, and how we can help drive the sort of competitive changes or, or um, process that are needed to really um, get the gains and, uh, we need across provincial New Zealand. But it's really just bringing back a level of discipline. In terms of labour markets, there has been an immigration reset. As mentioned, I, I firmly believe there is going to be a war for talent across developed countries. And we need to ensure that what we do is we provide New Zealanders with the training they need to fill high-skilled jobs, but also provide them with um, a value proposition to remain in New Zealand. It's one of the reasons why I've no doubt the Minister of Finance has talked about a high-wage economy. We are going to need that. The, a former Minister of Finance in a previous government said that one of our competitive advantage was a low-waged um, economy. That just won't cut it in a post-pandemic world where the Canadians and the Americans and the Australians and the Brits are all after our talent. So we need to provide a value proposition for why people would come here, why experts and those with, with high skills would, would choose New Zealand over those other countries. And certainly it is not through low, low wages. So our immigration settings uh, will change, but it doesn't mean that we skew immigration. Of course, we will still need people to drive the sort of technological innovations that will um, create a, a global sustainable competitive advantage, but we are certainly looking at, the, at labor market policies. Export growth is hugely important. And Damien O'Connor, and I'm, I'm also one of the, um, uh, the resource, the primary sector cluster ministers, and we are looking at what we need to do to our global brand. Well, we already have a pretty good global brand, a pretty outstanding global brand. And I'm talking as the Minister of Tourism as well as the Minister of Forestry. Um, but what we need to understand, and I think Fonterra is onto this now, is how we better capture margins as far down the supply chain as possible. You know, exporting commodities is not a future for, for a country like New Zealand. We need to be able to be branded as I think consumers, global consumers in that ultra premium end of the market become more engaged, more educated, more, more aware of what they are buying, where they're buying it from, and um, a level of brand integrity uh, and product integrity that they're putting on their own plates into their mouths of their, their friends and their family, but also their products they're buying. Um, and NZTE has been uh, funded to ensure that our exporters have the tools and the contacts and the capabilities to best achieve to their potential. So in conclusion, building forward better is not about a, a revised BAU where we, we tweak a few settings and, uh, and you know, just continue along the route we've, we've taken in the past because that absolutely will not work in a post-pandemic world. But rather it's about driving transformational change across the economy, and you, but using government levers to help set the direction and enable the change. But as always, well, nearly always, in partnership with key stakeholders, which includes every single person on this webinar. On that note, I will draw breath and, um, and welcome questions. Hello, Minister, thank you for that. Um, well, let's kick off. So, it's, these questions are gonna go across all your portfolios, Minister, I hope that's okay. Um, so, Based on the fact that Auckland has been in lockdown for nearly four months, what are the government's plans to ensure that Auckland is an attractive place to visit and a gateway to the rest of the world? Well, Auckland will always be our largest city of it, there's no doubt. It already is an attractive place to visit, but one of the things is we look at, at, at data is it doesn't tend to be a destination. It's in fact Aucklanders that drive our domestic tourism market. In fact, uh, in a pre-COVID world, 
Um, you could argue, I think quite successfully, not only had we neglected our domestic tourist sector, we had actively um, not marketed to it in any way, shape or form. Domestic tourism, as mentioned, was 60% in the pre-COVID world and Aucklanders make up a huge big part of that. Uh, but having said that, how do, we, um, how do we bring people into Auckland? We have um, provided the regional tourism organisation with a substantial there in Market Auckland. Um, tourism New Zealand is doing a lot of domestic marketing. What we did in the uh, when the pandemic held is, um, hit is allowed Tourism New Zealand to um, to transform from purely our international uh, eyes and ears towards a more domestic focus. So they will continue to do that. But I, if I have a look across what's happened. In New South Wales, for example, what we saw in a, in a post first lockdown world, I think Auckland, I think there was a lot of pent up demand there. And I think Aucklanders will spend in a way uh, once they open where you will see a, a pretty quick recovery in terms of um, eating, hospo and tourism attractions across our largest city. Great, thank you. Um, based on tourism then, um, how confident are you? Are they how confident are you that there will be a recovery in the tourism industry? Well, it will be slowly. Uh, and when I became the Minister of Tourism, you know, th this used to be a portfolio where you travelled around the world and, uh, and and hawked New Zealand's wares. You had the first flight to New York, you jumped on that, you had a great party and you came home again. And you really were ambassador when you travelled for everything that's great about New Zealand. The, the portfolio has changed, but so has the tourism industry. Again, in a, in a survey pre-COVID, New Zealanders were asked um, their views on international tourists, and 40% said there were too many international tourists in New Zealand. What that says to me is that uh, the tourism sector was um, was losing its social license to operate. And so I've um, you know, there are four pillars that I've said we need to rebuild tourism. First of all, tourism will not look the same as it did pre-COVID. And a classic example of what we're doing is we're putting a whole lot of um, new rules around freedom camping, for example. We don't want a whole lot of vans floating around camping where there are no facilities and doing what they were doing because there are no facilities. That doesn't fit our brand. It doesn't fit our expectations of what tourism is about. And it surely doesn't play into where we see tourism going forward. Brand New Zealand is now vitally important. In the Milford Sound, there were 870,000 people a year pre-COVID. That is not driving or living the brand or selling the brand when you think that over half of all posters around the world uh, marketing New Zealand to the Milford Sound, and you turn up to a camper van car park. We've got to do a lot better in that in that perspective. It's also about um, uh, working in partnership with key stakeholders, most important, but also about recovering costs where they lie. As ratepayers and taxpayers, we have subsidised global tourism in a way that I don't think uh, is sustainable, but also necessary. So, you know, we are reimagining tourism in a post-COVID world in a way that I think will look quite different. And, you know, we've, we've always talked about, well, we've, we've begun to talk about the high value tourist being attracted to New Zealand because it's going to cost a bit of money to come to this country. Uh, we need to be able to deliver on their expectations and that will take um, a rethink around how we do things. If we're going to um, talk about high value tourists, will you be bringing back the cruise ships anytime soon, Minister? Oh, the, 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 cru the cruise ships have a very important role to play, um, but you know, not at the moment. Uh, I, I think that the cruise ships uh, have done a very, globally, have done a, well, the cruise industry, I should say, has done a very good job at rehabilitating its image because at one point in time, we used to refer to them as, you know, floating petri dishes. Mm. Uh, but I think what they have done in terms of, as mentioned, um, rehabilitating their image has been fantastic. But, you know, of, of course they will come back to our waters, but as, as part of our reconnecting with the world strategy, uh, we are moving in a way that is first and foremost protecting the health and well-being of, of all Kiwis in our economy. But no, expect, them to, expect to see cruise ships in our waters again, absolutely. What key infrastructure development is needed for the tourism industry? I'd, I, if I'd known that I was getting a whole lot of tourism questions, I would have angled my speech more towards the, the tourism Sorry. side of my portfolio. I can do that's fine, that's fine. Um, well, first and foremost, we've got to live the brand. And I talked about, um, you know, uh, adapting to a, a zero carbon economy. You know, we need uh, 
charging electric car charging stations up and down this country. We need to encourage rental car companies to ensure that the vast majority of their vehicles that they're leasing out or renting out to people are electric vehicles. I mean, we're driving this across the, the, the government sector uh, and you'll see far more um, government electric cars. Um, you know, we are the, I'll go to that saying, we are the largest purchaser or leaser of vehicles. So that, that's one thing we need to do. You know, we need to ensure that our hotels and our, and our accommodation are fit for purpose when people are spending a whole lot of money coming over here and they have high, very high expectations. That's a critical part of this. But we've also got to make sure that we tell our stories in a way that um, that engages with people. And with few exceptions, I don't think we tell our stories particularly well. And we have some fantastic stories to tell in this country. People may be aware of the Milford Opportunities Project, and I suppose it is just one example of how we're looking at how we can sort of uh, completely revamp um, from both structure and a storytelling perspective, uh, what is one of New Zealand's iconic vis visitor destinations. I talk about tourism, so I'm trying to find you a question that's not no, look, I'm, I'm happy to answer tourism questions. <laughs> yep, no, a lot of our members seem to want to know about tourism. Um, well, to all your members, I'd say book your, you know, book your Book your travel down to Hawke's Bay. There's some fantastic wineries there. Make sure you visit Napier and pump some money into the Napier economy and we'll love you. Yeah. Here's another one. How will government ensure regional New Zealand isn't left behind in the economic recovery from COVID-19? Yeah, and look, it's a very good question. As mentioned, there was the Provincial Growth Fund. It was obviously implemented in a pre-COVID world, but there is still a substantial amount of work going on across our regions um, due to the rollout growth fund projects but as mentioned we've now got the regional strategic partnership fund and that is about focusing regions once again on where they're global or where global where their advantages are and as a government how we can work really closely with those regions to ensure that they they're creating jobs that are fit for purpose that those jobs that are sustainable that the industries that are building up around certain clusters uh, are driving growth and competitiveness and also ensuring um, uh, that local residents or people who live in the regions have the skills necessary to drive the sort of growth that we believe is possible. We've set up regional schools leadership teams. Uh, there is a lot of work in the regions in a way that I haven't seen before, and it's really empowering key decision makers um, to move forward because uh, it's fantastic to see. I mean, look, I'm from Napier. I'm one of four children. Uh, at the end of the seventh form, which is year 13 for, for the younger people on the call, I left the city vowing and declaring never to come back to Napier. You know, I've been there, done that. It was a sleepy, boring town as far as I was concerned. I went out and I saw the world. I lived on the west coast of New Zealand, Christchurch, and I spent my last 10 years in New Zealand and Auckland after seeing the world. And I slowly realised that, in fact, you know, Napier and Hawke's Bay is a fantastic place to live and bring up kids. Now you'll never get me out of there. But what we've got to do again is provide a value proposition. And I've got four kids myself. I would love them to come back to Napier once they've seen the world and got educated and do what they need to do. We also have to provide a value proposition for our young people to head off, get educated, but also come back and uh, and bring up their families and bring their skills and their competencies, but also their uh, their businesses back to our provincial uh, economies. And, and we're beginning we're beginning to see that. And I think as, as house prices and the cost of living increases in our large cities, our provinces will become more and more attractive to those who can really add value. Great, thank you. Um, how important is it for us to utilize government infrastructure programs to grow and educate regional companies? Oh, huge. And, and one of my um, roles and responsibilities is, is government procurement. And the Minister of Finance, Grant Robinson and I are working very closely on how we um, government procurement from a, a cost plus, i.e. You know, the lowest cost wins, to implementing a whole lot of well-being aspects across that procurement um, area. So I think what you'll see across the regions is a greater focus on empowering SMEs, regional SMEs, to be part of the uh, procurement process and, and a lot of married businesses to be able to play a part in that procurement process. What we need to be able to do, though, is provide the tools and the, schools, uh, the skills and the competencies to allow these smaller businesses 
uh, to engage in a system which can be quite daunting if you're not part of it. And um, so government procurement and these government projects will, I believe, enable a whole lot of small companies to employ more people and, and, and grow from small into medium-sized companies and, uh, and, and take off from there. And I know you've got Minister Megan Woods addressing you later. She may well talk about the house building program that we've got going on around the country. And I have no doubt many of your members are aware of this, but that will provide an enormous opportunity for many people in the trades, for example, to be part of the growth that is going on across regional New Zealand. But that is by no way, that's, you know, there is a lot of work going on in the regions and it's really quite exciting. So. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Can I now pivot to another one of your portfolios, forestry? Because sure. we're also invested in this as well, Minister, you've got so many portfolios. So what is the state of infrastructure for our forestry industry and what are the prospects for additional onshore processing? That's a really good point. And one of the industry transformation plans that I talked about is forestry and wood processing. So we we're asking the question, why have we not got more processing in New Zealand at the moment? And we're trying to come up with solutions with regard to that. As Russia exits um, the export of raw, raw logs to China next year, we will become the largest importer of logs uh, in the world, certainly of softwood logs. And I don't think that's something we should be particularly proud of. Um, so what we are looking at doing is how do we capture much greater margins along that supply chain? How do we play a part in that? And that is one of the, 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 the overriding question that, um, that the ITP has been asked for. Having said that, uh, I've, um, one of the things I have done is I've reinstigated, re-established New Zealand Forest Service. Um, forestry is going to play a significant role in helping us mitigate, uh, well, well, not mitigate, sorry, um, and helping us achieve a number of our climate ambitions. So you will see um, a much more engaged and active forest service than I think you, you've, you've seen in the past, but it certainly is a huge role to play. But we would like to see far more timber or far more logs processed in New Zealand than are currently done. Great, thank you. Um... We've got another one around logs. To what extent will we see a resurgence in adding value to primary resources as a solution to the supply chain, chain challenge, i.e. a return to processing logs and producing a timber product, producing timber products locally? Yeah, again, I, you know, we, we have, have helped in this. The Provincial Growth Fund has, in, has provided loans uh, to a number of timber processing companies um, up and down the country in order to help them gear up, be competitive, but also capture the margins along the supply chain. Um, you know, the two of the largest invest, recent investments, one has been at Red Stag, 100% uh, New Zealand owned, and they have done a fantastic job at looking at how they can take logs and create um, engine, a form of engineered wood product. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I think they will do well and anyone else will do well is as a government we have... We have, met, we have basically said uh, any building that is built by the government or for the government with a value over to, uh, $9 million must use the building um, materials with the lowest carbon footprint. In essence, what we're saying is you've got to build out of wood. And so this will provide quite a large market actually for um, engineered wood products. So we're not just talking about your, your dwangs and your struts that make a you know, your stock standard one-story residential property. We're talking about, you know, your glue lamb, your engineered wood products, your CLTs that will that have the same level of structural integrity that concrete and steel do, but actually uh, are a lot more environmentally sustainable. So I think you know, that market in itself, will, will the recognition that the government is driving that will create certainty in a market where we need more players. Right. Can I ask a question now around innovation? So, mm. in your opinion, do we have the right policy settings to create the levels of innovation we need in the modern age? And if not, what do we need to do to better foster these? Yeah, um, I don't think we did uh, as we came into, an, into government. And now what we are doing is looking at those settings because, you know, the world is getting more and more competitive. As, as mentioned, as I chair... I small business forum and goodness me you look at what is happening around the world or certainly in the APEC nations but now around the OECD in terms of driving innovation we you know the uptake of technology and, and in particular digital technologies will determine how successfully 
we are from a global perspective uh, going forward. And we absolutely need to get our settings right that allow the uptake of, um, of capital that will drive productivity and innovation. This is one of the really big questions, Claire, that we are asking our ITP, certainly you know, in advanced manufacturing uh, and ICT, which David Clark is leading, uh, and Agritech. We're saying, you know, how do we drive the level of innovative uptake that we know we will need to be globally competitive? So there's a big work program around this. It's absolutely supported by Cabinet and certainly supported by the Minister of Finance, which if you want to get anything across the line is very, very important. Um, but expect to see some announcements over the next 12 months around what this will look like going forward. Great, thank you. Um, I've now got one on green infrastructure. So what else can government do to grow the green infrastructure support systems through its own purchases? Well, you know, I, I talked about the fact that um, if you want to build a building for the government or by the government, the government wants to build, then it's got to be... Uh, uh, over 9 million, it's got to use the uh, the lowest carbon um, emitting products. We've also released something on Friday, actually, myself and James, which said building over 25 million has to meet Green Star 5 rating, which is which is a high rating in terms of environmental sustainability and, and operation. So we're doing that. We are um, uh, mandating electric vehicles across the state very good reason why not. We are taking boilers, coal-fired boilers, out of a whole lot of government agencies, and this, this includes schools, hospitals, prisons, uh, defence force, um, and replacing them with, with um, much more environmentally friendly or carbon neutral um, ways to, to heat. Um, you know, we, we are very, very driven to ensure that we meet our carbon zero 2050 objectives, and we need to start now uh, hence the reason why there is a massive program with regard to this. You know, we're looking down at TY at the moment and saying, you know, what can replace TY that drives our, you know, that drives our ambitions. Um, there are forestry companies at the moment that are looking at, um, you know, how they can replace electricity with, with cogen plants. The, you know, the, the level of infrastructure on the books at this point in time and the amount that is uh, under active consideration is substantial will drive incredible change over the next sort of 10, 15, 20 years. Do you have a view on um, what's the most urgently needed um, infrastructure in the in the region? Is there any project that you think that is the most critical at this time? Um, I, I, well, there, there are some easy wins, uh, like replacing um, your, your internal combustion engine with electric engines. Um, but what that needs, of course, is, um, is a network of charging that make it easy and viable for people to buy an electric vehicle and know that they're not going to run out of juice you know, along the Lake Chapo Road. In fact, there is a charging station along the Lake Chapo Road. Mm -hmm. But it's that. But it's. But it's. All, I, when I think of what the government is doing in terms of the sense of urgency, um, decarbonising uh, the transport fleet. That is really important because the transport fleet is, is huge. If I look at um, where we're going to generate our power from, I mean, Huntley at the moment, you know, we are burning a hell of a lot of coal in Huntley. That is just not sustainable in any way, shape or form. So it's looking at how we can generate energy in a way that is environmentally sustainable and, and helps decarbonise our economy. There's just a lot going on, Claire, and it's all urgent at this point in time. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of change being driven across the economy. Yeah. Um, one final question, Minister. What's your views on um, Auckland Light Rail and um, how how it will help Auckland keep going economically? Yeah, well, I, you know, I lived in Auckland for 10 years. I lived in Mount Eden. I lived in Remuera. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I visit Auckland a lot. Well, I used to go to Auckland a lot and I, and I envisage that I'll be in Auckland a lot going forward. And, you know, the traffic is something I absolutely do not miss when I head home and I'm eight minutes from the airport and I don't live close to the airport in Napier. Um, you know, we, we've all heard, those of us who lived in Auckland have heard of Sir Dove Meyer Robinson's plans for a, an integrated rail system and how it was overruled. And we look back with fondness and think shivers, what could have been if we'd been a lot more innovative and, and, future, and future thinking back then. 
But that, that, that project in particular, you'll probably need to talk to to, uh, to Michael Wood about. But um, we absolutely realise we need to do something in Auckland because the traffic is inhibiting productivity. There's no doubt about that. Uh, getting cars off the road is a huge big focus. Um, and engaging communities uh, is is massively important. So, you know, we absolutely do, do need to be innovative in how we plan our traffic flows and our, you know, our urban planning environment um, for the 21st century. And it's not based around internal combustion engines. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Minister. And thank you for answering questions on all of your portfolios. I could have thrown a few at small business, but I thought I better not, you know. <laughs> so, but I really do appreciate your time. Um, I just want to allude to our members next that um, coming up next, we've got Andrew Weir. He is an author and city economist from the city of Melbourne. And that'll be starting at 1.15 after a short five minute break. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.